Uh, just a quick introduction here, Rob Warren, who is the director of the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation and professor of sociology, as well as an uh, IPUM's principal investigator is uh, going to introduce Steve. Thanks, Kathy. I am Rob Warren. I, I use uh, he, him pronouns. Um, you've heard some of the outstanding research uh, based on IPUM's data, and I, I get the pleasure of introducing the person that you might call the mastermind and creator of IPUMS in the first place. Uh, and that, of course, is Steve Ruggles. Steve got a BA uh, in 1978 from a little college in Madison. I'm not sure if it's still there, University of Wisconsin, I think. Um, he then went on to get master's and PhDs from the University of Pennsylvania. And he came to Minnesota in 1985. He's currently the distinguished McKnight University Professor and Regents Professor of History and Population Studies. Uh, he not only founded IPUMS, but he is the current director of the IPUMS Center. He previously served as uh, in, my, in my role as the University of uh, Minnesota ISRDI's uh, inaugural director and as the inaugural, inaugural director of the Minnesota Population Center when it was founded in 2000. He served as the uh, President of the Population Association of America in 2015, the first historian to hold that position. He also served as the president of the Association of Population Centers for a few years, president of the Social Science History Association for a few years. He's been active on any number of national advisory and study committees, including the Census Bureau Scientific Advisory Committee, the National Science Foundation Social Behavior and Economic Sciences Advisory Committee, and many more. As you'll hear about momentarily, just over three decades ago, approximately 30 years, Steve encountered challenges in trying to do substantive research on changing family structures, given the limitations of the data at his disposal, and he decided to do something about it. Doing something about it wasn't what was so innovative. Many of us who encounter data problems or measurement problems do something about it. But what Steve did that was really innovative was rather than hoarding that solution to himself, he shared it with others by creating what was then called the Integrated Public Use Microdata Series and what is now IPMS. like AT&T doesn't stand for anything either. IPMS now offers US and international census and survey data from over a hundred countries. It includes population and housing data, of course, but also agricultural censuses from around the world, labor force and health surveys, tabular and summary file data. Not only does IPMS offer a wealth of data to researchers, policymakers, journalists, and others, it also preserves data that might otherwise be lost. My understanding is that something like two thirds of the data in the IPMS collection don't exist anywhere else or can't be accessed anywhere else. In recognition of the enormous value of IPMS and of Steve's integral role in creating and building it, Steve's been recognized many times. In, in 2003, he received the Robert Lapham Award from PAA in recognition of lifetime contributions that blend research with the application of demographic knowledge to, pop, to policy issues. In 2009, he received the Walter E. Miller Award from, the, from ICPSR uh, for meritorious service to the social sciences. Other accolades, accolades include being done, dubbed King of Quant by, by Wired Magazine in 1995. He was called a Wonk Blog Certified Data Wizard by the Washington Post's Wonk Blog in 2014, which noted that losing to Steve in name that data is like losing to Adele on American Idol. In 2022, Steve received the prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant. Through all of these accomplishments, Steve has been a fierce advocate for publicly accessible data and for maintaining invaluable data resources for the public or for the, for the data user community writ large. He continues to be committed to expanding the IPMS database and preserving data and functionality. The vision to create IPMS definitely qualifies as genius, but Steve goes beyond genius. He's built an organization that seeks to meet the ambitious goal of democratizing access to data, describing the world's changing population by making them easily usable, interoperable, and free. This vision and mission of IPMS are the beacon of Steve's brilliance. I'm proud to introduce him to talk to you today about IPMS over the past 30 years and grateful to him for his work ensuring these data are available long beyond the next 30 years. Introducing the King of Quant, Steve Ruggles. Oh, 
Thanks, Rob. Uh, very flattering. So the origin of IPAMS can be traced to this machine. This is the UNIVAC 1105 that was used to uh, process the 1960 census. Now, the 1960 census was the first to be computerized. The Census Bureau had commissioned the world's first digital commercial computer for the 1950 census, but it showed up too late, and so they uh, really couldn't use it. Uh, this was a this was a pretty big beast. Uh, it it uh, uh, covered uh, uh, 5,000 square feet, uh, and uh, it cost about a hundred million dollars in in 2023 dollars. This okay. Okay. So the computerized census led directly to the invention of microdata. Uh, in 1962, the Census Bureau released a systematic one in a thousand sample of the individual level census returns. They, they limited the geographic detail to preserve confidentiality, but otherwise it was just the basic data that they had. It came on 13 UNIVAC tapes, or you could get the one in 10,000 version on um, punch cards. So this was a revolutionary concept. Before the 1960 public use sample, census data consisted of tables printed in books that you would go get in the library. This is the table on school enrollment from the 1950 census broken down by age group. Microdata is much more powerful. You can make your own measures of family structure. You can compare the characteristics of husbands and wives. You can do individual level multivariate analysis. And it makes it comparatively easy to make comparisons across time and space, which is often challenging with tabular data. Consider this example. These are the age groups used to measure school attendance in the 1980 census. So you could do, uh, you could, it was broken down by five and six year olds, then seven to 13 year olds, 14 and 15 year olds, 16 and 17 year olds. Well, they changed it in 1990 uh, to different age groups. And then they decided to change it again in 2000. So there's just no way to use the published census data to, to measure high school dropout uh, in, in the census. So, but in, with microdata, it's no trouble. You got a variable on age, you got a variable on school, and so you can make any classification you want. And so that makes it much easier to make comparisons over time. For, okay, for 1970, uh, the Census Bureau made big improvements to the microdata. They expanded the uh, uh, de sample density 60 fold from a one in a thousand sample to six one in a hundred samples. They uh, added a lot more detail, especially geography. And then they made critical improvements to the 1960 data. They produced a much bigger sample. And more importantly, they revised it so that the record layout and the codes used for all the variables was identical to the new 1970 samples. And so everybody started doing research on changes between 1960 and 1970, and, and there was an explosion of research. So this was the situation in the mid 1970s when Sam Preston got the idea of extending the series backwards. The 1900 census had just been made available to researchers at the National Archives uh, under the 72 year confidentiality rule. So Sam got some funding from NSF and he created a small national sample of the 1900 census. At almost the same time and completely independently, Hal Winsborough at the University of Wisconsin got the idea to make new samples for the 1940 and 1950 censuses. Those data were still covered by the confidentiality rules. So the data had to be created 
at the Census Bureau Processing Center in Manhattan, Kansas, and that made it uh, uh, very expensive. In fact, it was uh, probably the most uh, expensive social science project that had then been undertaken. Then when the 1910 census became public in 1982, Preston launched a second project to create a, pro a sample for that census. And, and I watched all of these developments at close hand. I was at the Center for Demography and Ecology as an undergrad uh, in, when the 1940 and 50 project was launched. And then I spent several summers in Madison while it was underway. And I returned as a postdoc just as 40 and 50 were completed. Uh, and in the meantime, I was a graduate student at Penn where Preston was on my dissertation committee and I wrote my dissertation using the 1900 uh, uh, sample and uh, closely watched the launch of the 1910 project. Well, by the mid-1980s, both Sam and Hal uh, were sick of making historical census samples, and so they gave me copies of their proposals, and I used that to write an NIH proposal to create a sample of the 1880 census. This is the what the manuscripts look like. Uh, we launched that project in 1989. Uh, we hired four professional data entry operators and a half a dozen grad RAs, and we typed in half a million cases from the enumerator's manuscripts like the one shown here. By 1991, we had nine microdata samples for eight census years. Uh, uh, we had microdata samples for eight census years. We had a ninth one that was the 1990 census that was uh, uh, being created. Uh, and here are the code books and they were all incompatible except for 1960 and 1970. They had different codes, different record layouts, different organization of the documentation. Even the pair of Winsboro samples for 1940 and 1950 were completely different from one another. And the pair of Preston samples for 1900 and 1910 were completely different from one another. So this is what I mean. This is the codes for relationship uh, in the 1900, uh, uh, public use sample. There were 72 categories. In 1940, uh, the variable had 23 categories. Uh, in 1980, they decided to divide it into two different variables, but it works out to 20 unique categories. Uh, and and uh, they're, they're all incompatible. So in 1991, I wrote a proposal to NSF to create a harmonized version of the nine microdata samples. There were four main goals, harmonized codes, consistent record layout, integrated documentation, and no loss of information. There's several possible dates you could use for the origin of IPMS. The name dates back to 1990. I don't remember the exact date, but I clearly remember bursting into the history department lounge on the sixth floor of the social science department and uh, uh, yelling uh, to the assembled graduate students, uh, IPMS, Integrated Public Use Microdata Series. And I thought it was a great idea. Uh, they were completely unenthusiastic. They thought it was a terrible name. Everybody thought that except for me. And I decided it was a good name. <laughs> The first conference publication presentation about IPMS was in May, 1991. You could use that date. We submitted the proposal to make IPMS in August 15th, 1991. The first mention in print uh, was in October, 1991. This is it. And you know, it, it's got the phrase integrated public use microdata series, but it's all lowercase and it's got an indefinite article. So maybe this doesn't really count. A few months later, there was a first publication that used a definite article and uh, a capitalization. Uh, so uh, I was never modest about IPMS. Uh, uh, I, uh, felt that it would be the most important resource for the study of social structure. The NSF project officially started in 
April 1, 1992, but we've already been working on it for by about a year for that by that point. And uh, on October, November 1st, 1993, uh, I thought we were finished. Uh, I sent out this email the next day. The autumn from hell is over. It went out to a dozen RAs who had worked on the big push to finish IPMs, three of whom are still working on IPMs today. So with 326 hours altogether, that works out to an average of 27 hours apiece over three days. That was a Saturday, Sunday, and Monday in the middle of the semester. For some people, it was a lot more. I can only conclude that I was a cruel tyrant. Here are three of the RAs who worked on the project in a photo of our from our RA office in 1993, Lisa Dillon, Matt Mulcahy, Diana Magnuson. We went off to the annual meeting of the Social Science History Association the next day, uh, where we publicly announced that it was ready to go. And then we got back from the conference and we discovered some disastrous bugs. We had to rerun everything. And so we announced we were ready, the data were ready for download at 9.26 a.m. on November 19th, 1993. Uh, and the first download for our anonymous FTC site was completed 11.12, less than two hours after we posted the data on the FTP site. Finally, we could date IPMS from its first use in a published article. The first two articles using IPMS appeared just three months later in February 1994. And you may wonder how I managed to get two articles through peer review and production in less than three months after the data became usable. Uh, and the answer, of course, is that I didn't use IPMS for these articles. <laughs> I used the same ad hoc harmonization methods I'd been using for the previous decade. And if you look closely, you can see that I didn't actually state that the analyses used IPMS, except for the first sentence of the ASR abstract. In the text, I implied that the results were based on IPMS. Uh, and I described how great IPMS was and how it could be used for this purpose. IPMS was successful because of two key innovations. The first is structured metadata uh, that we, we developed in 1991. And the second was in 1995, an interactive web-based dissemination system. So let's go over the metadata. This is, uh, this is what the metadata looked like in, in those days. Uh, and I'll zoom in here. I'll explain the various parts. Uh, these are the input data locations for each sample. They were all column format at the, in those days. And these were where the data quality flags were. Uh, these are the original codes from each sample. And these are the standardized composite codes. So the first two digits are uh, consistent across uh, all of the data sets, but then to lose no information, we have these detail codes, which are the second two digits, that, which is how we avoid losing any information. And then we have the standardized labels. This is an excerpt from the budget justification from the 1991 IPMS proposal. And this was a trivia question this morning. Uh, these are, we, we budgeted for 459 track tapes uh, uh, for the project. And the idea was we needed 150 tapes to import the data from the various uh, places where it was stored, Census Bureau, ICPSR, whatever. Uh, then we needed uh, 150 tapes to make a harmonized version. And then we needed 150 tapes so we could make a copy of that and send it to ICPSR because we we're gonna have ICPSR do all the data dissemination. Well, as, as uh, Dave mentioned this morning, we never bought a single tape. And the reason why was because the internet came along in the nick of time. This is, as I showed before, the first data download uh, from our anonymous FTP site. On November 11th, 1993, eight days before the first IPAMS internet download, an undergrad from the University of Illinois released the first successful web browser for a PC. That was NCSA Mosaic 1.0. At that time, there were about 500 websites in the world. This is our first website. It appeared about 15 months after the Mosaic browser. 
And this is what websites looked like at the time. They weren't really interactive. What you could do with them is you could click on one of the hyperlinks and we either take you somewhere else or it would give you a file. Uh, and that's it. And that's what our website did. Here was our staff at the time. I'm the one in the back with the brown beard. Uh, this is Todd Gardner. He was a grad student and he was our programmer. He came to grad school after a stint at Control Data and he wrote a program to manage the IPAMS Fantasy Football League. Uh, and I, I was amazed. You could make choices on one page and they would affect the layout of the next screen. Uh, and I realized that we could take this fantasy football program and hook it up to our Fortran program that we used to extract usable samples from IPAMS and let users design their own customized data sets with any combination of census years and variables and, and subsets of the population. And so, so we did that. It took a couple of months. We had it, uh, uh, and, and this is what it looked like um, in November, 1995. On the first page, you select any combination of census years, size of sample, what kind of data format you want. The next page, you select the variables you want in your ext extract. And on the third page, you could subset the population to make it more manageable. For example, specifying only working age women from Minnesota or something like that. Because you know the big problem with these data sets at the time was they were really, really big and it was hard to download the data because uh, the internet wasn't that good. So in the next year, we got all the documentation into hypertext format, so it was no longer necessary to download thousands of pages of documentation. Now you could look at the relevant bit of documentation you needed right as you were making your extract. Well, between 1992 and 2006, we made a lot more historical data sets. We filled in all the missing census years. We expanded the comparatively small Preston samples and it allowed you to make graphs like this. I've published this graph many times uh, and uh, this is the percentage of people uh, age 65 or older residing with their own children from um, 1850 to 2000. It was easy to use. This is a graph my daughter Abby made when she was 12 years old for her History Day project, a century of women in science and engineering. Here she is working away at the computer. In 1999, there were two big developments that changed the trajectory of IPAMS, the start of IPAMS International and the start of our full count census projects. Uh, this uh, on the left is the first IPAMS International website. On the right is Bob McKay. IPAMS International was Bob's idea. I thought it was crazy. Uh, in 1999, only the United States had true public use microdata. They had research samples in the UK and Canada, but they had rules that said you couldn't take them out of the country. And there were a few other countries where you could get data, but only if you knew the right people in the statistical office. And so I thought it was crazy to think that we could convince a significant number of countries to let us harmonize and redistribute their data. But Bob was persistent and he's a highly affable guy. Uh, he sold encyclopedias door to door when he was in college. Um, and he succeeded in winning over an amazing number of statistical agencies. We had a lot of data recovery to do. Most of the census offices made uh, the published census volumes and then they stuck the tapes on a shelf and they never used them again. The, the, the microdata were not in use in most countries of the world. This is the 1973 census of Sudan and you can see it's very dusty. If you see there's a hole in the wall, there's the de desert outside in the back there letting in the sand. Uh, we identified all the right tapes. Here's the tape, uh, tapes arriving from Sudan at our data recovery shop. This is the tape for Darfur. Here's the 1980 census of Bangladesh. The problem here is mold. And the Bangladeshis wouldn't let us take the tapes out of the country because they only had one copy. And so we set up a tape washing facility uh, at the Central Bureau of Statistics. And this is the tape washing station. 
the staff were trained to wash the tapes. They washed a lot of tapes and we were able to recover the 1980 census. So today, IPUMS has data from 157 countries. There's just a few holdouts here. The other big development of 1999 was our first full count census project. We've done a series of projects to create full count data sets that include entire enumerated populations. Most of these are for the US uh, and they've all been collaborations with other organizations, usually genealogical organizations. And um, it started in 1998. I was uh, surfing the net as we called it. And I stumbled across a bulletin board where a volunteer for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, was announced that they had just finished their section of data entry on the 1880 census. And I realized the Mormons must be typing in the whole thing. And so I started making cold calls to the, uh, uh, to the church. And that's really hard to do. Uh, with, uh, uh, but eventually I managed to find the right person. And we eventually, after a long period, we, we managed to negotiate a deal to clean up the data in exchange for a right to disseminate the data to the academic community. Uh, the Mormons spent, had spent 11 and a half million hours typing in the data over 17 years, and it was a real mess. So they published it on 56 CD ROMs. We published it on the internet. Uh, and then they gave us this nice plaque. It says that we made an exceptional contribution to creating the database. After we did 1880, we did another collaboration with LDS for 1850. And our next full count project was a collaboration with the Census Bureau. And it had two goals. First, to get a verified version of all the surviving historical data uh, census, decennial census data that's within the Census Bureau, and then to convert those data into IPMS format and make them available for the, through the Census Research Data Centers. Uh, and the first part went pretty smoothly until we got to 1960, and we discovered that every copy of the 1960 census that there was in the Census Bureau uh, was missing Chicago and most of Cook County. So we had to do another data recovery project. Now, you'll recall that the 1960 census was the first one to be computerized. For the first time in 70 years, no punch cards were used for 1960. Instead, the census was digitized using the first high-speed optical mark recognition system. It was called FOSDIC, and this is the machine. It's the film optical sensing device for input to computers. So the way 1960 went, was forms like this were sent out to each household and the householders filled them out. And then the enumerator went around from door to door and they transferred the information from the, those sheets that the household had filled out under these bubble sheets, which are just like uh, uh, you use for SATs or standardized tests, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, the, here's the question for uh, the codes for clothes washers of different types. And you fill in the little dot. Uh, and then the sheets were microfilmed and Fosdick read the microfilm directly onto magnetic tape. And so all we had to do was find the microfilm and then scan it and recover the data for Cook County. Well, I made some phone calls and I discovered that the data were stored in this cave in Lenexa, Kansas. It's a very big cave. Uh, and so we uh, set up this scanning station uh, in the cave. You can see the cave wall behind there. We recovered the data and um, uh, made a new, uh, and we made a new microdata sample, the public use microdata sample as well, a 5% sample with good geography for 1960. Our next full count project was the 1940 census. There was at the time the biggest uh, digitization project from a single source ever undertaken. Uh, we worked with Ancestry.com to get it done with generous funding from three agencies. So since 2015, we've had a bunch of projects. We filled in the rest of the censuses, except for 1950, which is still in progress. This is uh, the uh, full series available. The orange are available through the census uh, uh, federal statistical research data centers, and the, uh, the blue ones are the public use files. And so uh, once we add uh, 2020, uh, there will be about two and a half billion records in the whole series. 
So why do you need so much data? Well, for one thing, you can't link samples. Um, and it allows you to study small population subgroups. You can link full count data to small data sets like labor union data or recent surveys of aging. Uh, and you can uh, uh, analyze contextual effects to, to, to uh, figure out the impact of things like lead in the water supply on outcomes. Linking is the big one. We've been working very hard to link the censuses across time and to other sources. And we're soon gonna be able to trace individuals and families across their lives and over generations for 170 years. Uh, uh, and if you wanna know more about this project, uh, you should check out our poster this afternoon uh, where I will answer any questions you may have. So we didn't limit ourselves to microdata starting in 2001. We started working on aggregate data and boundary files. This is the first website for the National Historical Geographic Information System launched in 2001. Uh, and it covers aggregate level data for the United States in 1790, which is like I said, a lot more challenging than microdata. Uh, and the project also proposed to create historical boundary files describing key statistical areas. We also started adding surveys. Uh, uh, these use the IPAMS infrastructure that we developed for censuses, for data integration, and, and for dissemination. Uh, but we gave each new project a new name at this time. So this was not called IPAMS, it was called the IHIS, the Integrated Health Interview Series, which provided 50 years of data from the National Health Interview Survey. In 2005, we added time use data. The Integrated Demographic and Health Series uh, was called IDHS, uh, and that began in uh, 2011. Um, but so, you know, all these these uh, projects shared some degree of infrastructure, uh, and and they were all IPAMS like, but they were all separately branded, and that changed in 2016. We brought everything under the IPAMS umbrella, and and this helped not only in terms of branding, but also in terms of operations. We were able to get more consistency across data collections in our methods and um, and and get more interoperability between these various collections. And we continue to add new collections, including the Gates Foundation PMA data in 2017, the International Historical GIS dedicated to uh, international aggregate level data in 2020. And just last week, the newest edition, IPOMS Mix, disseminating the UN's multi-indicator cluster surveys. The quantity of IPAMS data has grown dramatically over the past three decades. Uh, if you count the data in the federal statistical research data centers, it should exceed 4 billion records by the end of this year. IPAMS users have made uh, almost 5 million data requests. That includes uh, close to 2 million customized data extracts, 2.5 million online analyses, 600,000 requests for tabular data. We expect almost 500,000, almost half a million requests for data in 2023, which is almost one request per minute around the clock on average. It's among the most intensively used scientific databases there is. Google Scholar lists almost 30,000 citations. ProQuest lists 3,500 PhD dissertations. IPAMS is particularly visible in top journals of social science. It's by far the biggest source in demography, the flagship journal of population research. Over 300,000 fine people have registered to use IPAMS at almost at any given time. The user community, community the active communities around 68,000, and we get 500 new users a week including 150 graduate students. 20 years ago, I bragged in a grant proposal that we disseminated three terabytes of data over the preceding six years. Now we disseminate three terabytes of data every two days. So that's 20 megabytes per second on average. It's also a core resource for a wide range of uh, international and domestic agencies. 
especially the UN, it intensively uses it, but in the US there have been 54 National Academies study reports that have used IPMs for policy recommendations, including 12 in just the last two and a half years. So there's two lessons um, from IPMs that correspond to the two big innovations I started with. First of all, uh, if you wanna make diverse data sets interoperable, you need metadata. You need metadata that drives the data integration. Uh, uh, you can't do it by, by just recoding uh, data. It's not manageable. And the second thing is you need data access software that will allow people to pool data from different sources and uh, uh, subset it to get usable uh, data sets. So um, for what about the future? Well, there's many things, but I'm just gonna mention two. Uh, one thing I think we need to do is to build a general framework for linking all available U.S. records of, of all types uh, and, and, and make them easily accessible and interoperable. This is, uh, this is a task that, you know, I hope we can, we can make much progress on in the next five years. And secondly, and this, this applies to, to the international data as well as, uh, as well as the US, but especially international data, to develop contextual data using government statistics, remote sensing, whatever sources, and make them easily interoperable with the microdata. And I think that these two, these two initiatives will have a huge impact. So that's it. Here's a IPMs RAs from 1996. Thank you very much.